good afternoon, everybody. We are welcome to this CEO dialogue, which is trying to connect leaders across Africa. My name is Carol Musyoka. I'm the founder and CEO of Carol Musyoka Consulting, and I'm also adjunct faculty at the Strathmore University Business School. It gives me great pleasure to be your moderator this afternoon. My understanding is that we will be having over 400 participants today, and we've got you know, from all over the world. We've got 19 African countries signed up to be in this this uh, uh, dialogue. We also have non-African countries. We've got visitors from France, Belgium, Brazil, the United States, Switzerland, Canada, India, Sweden, and Netherlands. So we're hoping to give you a really, really scintillating two-hour seminar, and we hope you get to make the best out of it. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our Dean of the Strathmore University Business School, his name is Dr. George Jenga, to give the opening remarks. Dr. Jenga. Thank you, our moderator, Carol, and our chair for this session. Um, I must apologize from the very beginning, ladies and gentlemen, executives, CEOs, and my colleagues here at the panel that I may not be with you through more than 20 minutes because of other issues. And I'm really glad that this uh, CEO forum is going to discuss one of the most important issues for our continent and its expansion. I know the background is COVID, but frankly speaking, uh, we have been talking about public-private partnerships in Kenya, for instance, since the year 2007. Uh, and even earlier, we had public-private partnerships. We realized that um, Africa is growing. And despite the crisis that we are facing now, um, there are panelists here who will subscribe to the principle that this is just a platform for growth, a growth in shared value. And today we have the CEO of the Shared Value, Tiki Bernard, whom I will be inviting later to give you a remark. Dear panelists, uh, all of you, one by one, Judith, uh, Tiki, I've mentioned you, Carol, Ab Abdul Mukhtar uh, from the AFDB, Elizabeth Jenga, Peter Vandel, Dr. Peter Chimboa, great to see you here. Uh, 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 Janet Mohoro, um, uh, uh, Elizabeth Jenga, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you very much for discussing this issue, which is of fundamental importance for Africa. Now, when you think of public-private partnerships over that period that I've suggested, especially in my country here in Kenya, though we are thinking for the whole of Africa, you'll find that very reasonable policies have been structured. Mm -hmm the last uh, policy regulation in Kenya being around 2014, I think. Um, and the sectors, okay, um, the sectors where we need uh, up to this year, but now we have to review, the sectors are energy ports, roads, water sanitation, railways, airports, tourism, uh, ICT infrastructure, te telecommunications included there in a very special way, local government efficiency and structuring, housing, public works. Um, and uh, public works, we have to think of transportation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I thought the best way to inaugurate this panel discussion is to actually say something which I shouldn't be saying, but I'll say it for now because we have the Chatham rules, even though they are going to record them, but they should not quote me. And yesterday um, at 8.30 uh, p.m. In, in, in France, our president, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, signed the next PPP project. The next PPP project is not to say that we don't have current ongoing projects, we have several, with a target of $62 billion. Uh, of that, I think the public sector can fund about $25 billion um, and it's growing. Okay, I'm, I'm talking in USD terms, okay, just Kenya. Um, the $180 billion project, Kenya Shillings project, will be the city of Nairobi, from a place called Rironi, all the way to uh, 
city in Kenya called the Rift Valley, Nakuru in the Rift Valley, called Nakuru, formerly the provincial headquarters of the entire region of, of what we call the Rift Valley in Kenya. And all the way to a, a, a convergence point towards the borders of um, Uganda. The French government are going to fund that project through a PPP discussion and agreement, which they have already started. What is the issue with this project, which I congratulate the government of Kenya, and especially His Excellency, the President, for executing? The problems have been that, uh, whereas the policy is beautiful, whereas the structure of the PPP is foreseen at the executive level, where the principal secretaries and the cabinet secretaries need to converge on the projects, but they are not functional, they're like a board, to the PPP unit, where the actual decision and structuring takes place, to the nodes that uh, together combine the multiplicity and diversity of inputs into public-private partnerships uh, in action. Mm. That is at the ministerial level, we call them nodes. We find that uh, co-creation is um, suffering. And why is co-creation suffering? That is co-creation between the private sector and the government sector. I'm afraid the one word is uh, poor workmanship, poor public sector official personnel uh, thinking, all right? Uh, bad financial management thinking. So um, this project, if it had been left just to the infrastructure of the public-private partnerships using the policies, government does not like giving a free hand and a co-creation hand to the private sector. Why? Because the private sector is efficiency oriented. And this problem is of particular importance to your discussion. We have a policy, we have foreseen it. What would make government officials amenable to seeing efficiency rather than rent seeking in the project? Because rent seeking, uh, I'll, I'll give you one little example. Um, if you think of an airport in one of the towns where in near Nairobi, more than, less than 150 kilometers, when the project was presented to the public sector for budgeting and analysis, the cost sent is about 8 billion Kenya shillings. And uh, when you look deeply into it, it wasn't very efficiently budgeted. So I think a system was designed to move this to a military uh, project management. Now between 8 billion, the military came up with a cost of 330 million. I can keep explaining several projects like this. There is a problem. The public sector is not convinced that it is ready to give up the cost of doing business in government to the efficiency of joining hands with the private sector. And we really need to think about solutions. So let's not just discuss it, but think it very deeply. The second issue that worries me is that based on the research we did last year, one of our students, one of our public policy master students, Went, went out to look specifically at the area of the public-private partnerships in energy. And one of the outcomes and conclusions of the application of the law, policy, and regulations of the country is that they are beautiful, but we haven't done the civic education. And this question has arisen a lot now that I am working on another PPP, this one I'm directly concerned about, establishing a private sector development center for SMEs across the country in each of the counties. And you can't imagine the difficulties of trying to get policy makers in the public sector understand the efficiency they need to have to make competitiveness in small and medium enterprises effective. 
we keep quiet. Mm, we keep quiet. We have the AGOA, the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act with the United States for most of African countries. Well, if you look carefully, there is no civic education, or if it is there, it is not effective at all. So how, this second question is a very core question. How do we make the private sector understand the opportunities? Because ultimately, dear people, ultimately, all right, the question is, we need to grow as Africa. But to grow, we can't leave tax money as the only source of effective investment. We have to attract private investment. We have to attract efficient private investment. The current PPP project of the Nairobi um, superhighway that is being built from the airport to Rironi, from where the, the, the project I was talking about with the French government is going to take, with the French private sector and government, which is going to take place uh, in, in just a few months. Okay. The current one, which is the Nairobi uh, superhighway, uh, the charges for the commuters will be 600 shillings, which is reasonable. But not, not only that, as soon, it, it has been delayed for five years because of these problems I'm talking about. And there are many little things I'm not going to go into, but you should as panelists and as the executives go into. Uh, and I'm afraid I don't have one for the whole of Africa, but I think of the Chinese Silk Road that is soon going to come, which will depend a lot on public-private partnerships. The question is, inside that project within the superhighway for Nairobi, is that we are going to have a public transportation lane. We are going to have more efficient public transport. Uh, for a period of 25, the design, uh, build, uh, finance, operate, and maintain is going to take shape. Okay, whether with the Chinese government or with any other um, Chinese corporations or any other corporations from the United States, from France and the rest of the world. So how do we get the private sector and the civil society to participate in understanding the value of creating the future of Africa together with the governments? Why do we keep this separation? Why does the public sector not want to explain it to the private sector? These issues concern me deeply. Finally, co-creation for value delivery. When will we get our public, private, civil society, and development institutions co-create for the better of their continent? Because this is where shared value will be seen within the projects. And ladies and gentlemen, they are also the faith-based organizations, uh, which I have not mentioned here. But ladies and gentlemen, how are we going to encourage our public sector? What are we going to do to speak about the importance of public-private partnerships? Uh, with those few remarks, uh, Madam Carol, I think I have finished my time, isn't it? <laughs> I, I think that the conclusion is to invite private sector development, to invite shared value, to invite community growth, to invite the expansion of the Africa continental free trade area, to invite poverty eradication, to invite sustainability in our continent. There is no doubt that we must embrace public-private partnerships. But what do we do? We are the CEOs, we are the executives, we drive the economies of these countries. What do we do, my dear people? Mm. Is it our system of politics? Is it lack of communication? Is it poor personnel? What and how do we go around it? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so glad we are discussing this issue. Over to you, Carol, but before I do that, I'll invite Tiki Bana, the CEO of uh, Shared Value Africa, from whom we are uh, working together to start building shared value projects across the private sector and also the public sector in Africa. Uh, Tiki from South Africa has the license of the shared value project given to by Michael Porter uh, and uh, I forget the second name uh, of the other person who developed the concept of shared value. Uh, uh, Kramer, I think. Oh, Kramer. It. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, I forget that. Tiki is the CEO and she's here 
to transform Africa through shared value and developing shared value within our strategies in corporations and also in government. Over to you, Tiki, and thank you very much, Carol, for giving me this opportunity to speak and to introduce. And most welcome to all of you and to Strathmore. Thank you. Tiki, over to you. Thank you, Dr. George. Um, yes, I wish I could answer uh, all the questions you have, but I'm hoping that the panel will, will help us a little bit today on that. So as Dr. George said, my name is Tiki Barnard. I'm the CEO of the Shared Value Africa Initiative. We're, the regional, we're a pan-Africa organization and the regional partner of the Global Shared Value Initiative. Um, as Dr. George also said, started by Michael Porter and Mark Kramer. So our, our um, focus from a Shared Value Africa initiative perspective is to shift business mindsets, not only business, but government as well and civil society, because we have to create economic value and we have to create value for society. But please allow me to take a step back. So a lot has happened since the CEO dialogue on the 3rd of September. And Dr. George, I'm very happy because we can see that it's, it's, the conversations are growing and they're becoming more and more meaningful as we go along. So we've seen the 75th United Nations Global Assembly taking place now in September. It was also the five years since the SDGs were launched launched uh, and in the context of UNGA, there was also the fourth world economic forum sustainable development impact summit and there was also the un global compact discussions on uniting business for a better world so all of our leaders came together delivered their speeches they talked they hosted their roundtable discussions debated pledged their commitment put out calls for action and we concluded the proceedings so what now so what now is that it's time for action? Global action, local action, personal action. And we know, Dr. George, you mentioned it, it's not going to be easy post COVID-19. The rich have to do more for the poor. We need to create a more inclusive society and a more inclusive world. Solidarity is needed as we all share the same planet and we need to become action oriented. So our topic today is about economic recovery, creating value through public private partnerships. And as we look towards resetting our economies, please allow me to share, and I think Dr. George, I'm following you. I've got three points and some of them are even so close to yours, I have to mention. <laughs> so for me, point number one, is what Dr. George touched on, that political willingness. It goes without saying that PPPs can only succeed if there is political will. It's about trust, it's about partnerships, and it's about collaboration and sharing power. We must reset partnerships and change our planning to make way for new systems that are more flexible, agile, faster, better and, dare I say, more ethical. How we used to do things will not work in the post-COVID-19 world because we can never go back. We've said that in our previous CEO dialogues to what it was like before. My second point is we need to harness the capacity of the private sector and ensure that we build back better post-COVID-19. The World Bank estimates that more than 70 million people will slip back into poverty. And this is the first increase in global poverty since 1998. So our work needs to be conscious of building new foundations for our economic and social systems. And now is the opportunity for change. My last point is we also need investor willingness. In investor willingness to accept the risk and measure risk relative to long-term rewards and not the short-term way. It is about measuring risk by looking at financial and social out outcomes. And for that, we need a long-term view. In closing, I want to say thank you to all of you here today 
And I want to share something that the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said at the 75th UN Global Assembly. He said, none of us is safe until all of us is safe. And we should take that to heart. So thank you again for being here today. And I look forward to a really great discussion. Over to you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you so much, DK. That was very, very insightful, especially your top three things needed to make this work. Thank you very much. Very, 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 very useful. Without further ado, what I want to do is just introduce the topic and then introduce our keynote speaker. So public-private partnership, which is what, we, what the acronym PPP stand for, is crucial to the economic recovery of our continent. COVID-19 has set the Africa economic recovery path back, and it is now more important than ever be before that we address the local manufacturing, agricultural development, infrastructure development, transport links between countries, et cetera, that can lead to both job creation and critical economic recovery. We have seen in the past that collaboration between governments and, and currently, not in the past, but also currently, that collaborations between governments and the private sector during COVID-19 and how it has created a foundation for public and private sector collaboration. And that support should continue on the journey to economic recovery. What is needed now is increased financial support for growth sustaining infrastructure. Now we all know that Africa has a very large infrastructure need and an associated funding gap. PPPs can help both to meet the need and to fill the funding gap. Big development projects often involve the public sector arranging and providing finance. The public sector though needs to meet those financing requirements from its revenues or through borrowing. Now, by shifting the responsibility of finance away from the public sector only, PPPs can enable more investment in infrastructure and increased access to infrastructure services. We do realize that our PPPs are not the panacea for all of the public sector funding and infrastructure problems, and they're not always the most appropriate procurement option. There are many complexities and risks, and most of these can be minimized under certain circumstances and through careful management of the PPP design by the sponsoring authority, as Dr. Jenga talked about in his opening remarks. This requires public sector capacity, both in experience and expertise, to manage this process. Finally, public and private sector need to work more closely together, as the private sector does have the resources to implement a well-designed and managed PPP should take advantage of the potential of efficiency gains from the private, using the private sector. I'd now like to take this opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker. We had indicated in the brochures earlier that our keynote speaker was Mr. Joshua Oigara, who is the Group Managing Director of KCB Group. For those of who are not from Kenya, KCB Group is the largest financial organization Within the, Eastern, within the East African region. Unfortunately, Mr. Igara was called away very urgently on business, and he sent a very capable and very able as, um, representative in Ms. Judith C.D. Odiambo. Now, Judith is currently the Group Head of Corporate and Regulatory Affairs at KCB Group PLC. She leads the reputation management and strategic communication of the bank, having served in similar roles in water and transport sectors. She has also been leading the team in charge of development and implementation of the sustainability agenda for the group, the sustainable development goals, and the women in leadership network for the group. We look forward to hearing Judith's keynote speech, or keynote speech on this topic. Judith, over to you. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, and thank you to all of you who have joined to listen. Uh, as we go, as I had listened in the, for uh, the introductions uh, this afternoon, uh, we're in an afternoon session uh, here in East Africa. I'm sure some of you are saying good morning, others good night. Uh, so we do take cognizance of that. And so as we go through uh, just looking at uh, how do we create uh, value through public-private partnerships, which I just look at what KCB so far has done. 
And I think even as we listen to the other uh, panelists who will also share uh, their examples, we'll get an opportunity to learn more on what can be done in this area. We know that uh, public-private partnerships or the word itself partnerships uh, closely associates with our SDG number 17, uh, which of course talks about partnerships. So everything that we'll need to do in order to make a success of this means we'll need to work with different stakeholders who have different synergies uh, that we can bring together on board uh, so that all of us can be able uh, to, to bring the, the, the value uh, that we need in whatever uh, program that we want to run. Uh, so from an introductory part, uh, just to say that um, I'd like to thank Strathmore, I'd like to thank uh, the panelists, I'd like to thank Shared Value for having put uh, this session together. Uh, and so as we go through this session, we are hoping that uh, we are going to get some useful insights uh, in this session. We have seen what the negative impact of the pandemic uh, that has continued uh, to affect us at various levels. And this has happened in our personal lives. It has also happened in, uh, in our businesses and also our economy as a whole and the business uh, community. And so we, this will give us an opportunity just to reflect and re-examine uh, the roles uh, of each of these uh, 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 stakeholders and see what responsibilities and what roles does each need to play so that we can make a PP a reality. Again, to look to recover from this crisis, uh, we have also set the foundation for success uh, through co-creating. And so we hope that through this, it will enable us to bring private uh, efficiencies and finance to public sector delivery and offer the most assured way out of this crisis. Uh, we are looking at this crisis not as an immediate thing that we can resolve, but looking at it, how do we get out of it in the short term, in the mid term, and also in the long term, uh, even as we continue uh, to run our businesses, whether in the public sector or in the private sector. Uh, in Africa, of course, we do have a saying uh, which says that uh, when you want to go far, you don't go alone, you have to go with others. Uh, so again, uh, this, is an, uh, this PPP is an example of that, that we need all of us to galvanize uh, what we have so that we can boost our economy, uh, we, economies and also set our countries on an, economic, in an, on an economic recovery path, meaning that not one of the sectors has an answer to everything, but each one of us has to resonate and bring our ideas, our synergies, our expertise, our skills, uh, and, and bring that diversity so that uh, we can be able to realize uh, what uh, we need to see. The pandemic has also highlighted in an unprecedented, unprecedented way the need uh, to be agile, the need to be flexible in the way we operate, in the way we make decisions in delivering public services, and where the private sector is involved it's going also to continue to be a key thing and a key role in supporting uh, that agenda. So looking at the case for PPPs and how to catalyze uh, Africa's economic agenda even as we go forward. So PPP is crucial to the econo economic recovery of our continent and COVID-19 has set the Africa economic recovery path back and it is now important that we address uh, our local sectors and especially our manufacturing sectors, our agricultural development, our infrastructure development, transport links between countries to boost job creation and economic recovery. We have also seen that a collaboration between governments and private sector during this COVID-19 has created a foundation for public and private sector to continue the support for each other on the journey to economic recovery. So what is needed is increased financial support for growth to sustain this infrastructure. Africa also has, a huge, inf has huge infrastructure needs, uh, which uh, Dr. Njenga elaborated earlier, and it's also associated with also funding gaps uh, on it. And he gave us a good example of the numbers uh, of the PPPs uh, here in the country. And this can help both to meet and to need and to fill that funding gap so that we can be able to realize uh, the projects and the programs that we want to deliver for our society. 
Big development projects often involve the public sector arranging and providing finance. And therefore, the public sector needs to meet these financing requirements from its own revenues. And we have seen that through taxes or through borrowing. But we need to shift this responsibility for finance away from the public sector only. PPPs can enable more investments in infrastructure and increase access to infrastructure services. And using this private sector finance also, it allows the public sector to move large capital expenditure program off its balance sheet. So this has been a motivating factor we have seen for PPPs in countries where the constraint of finance on finance is a government uh, commitment uh, to a borrowing gap. So uh, in a nutshell, I'd just like to just share uh, PPPs and how have we utilized it at uh, KCB. I'll also give an example of just uh, two, uh, two of our programs that we have uh, used PPPs uh, so that uh, from there, I think it will be enable us to also have a deeper conversation on, on what is expected of us. So at KCB, uh, we have seen that uh, PPP's engagement uh, is something that we do on a day to day. Uh, the bank, of course, has been there for more than 100 years. So this is, this is something that we have continued uh, to find ourselves participating in over the years. Uh, so for years, we have partnered with government. We have also partnered with development partners. We have partnered with other private sectors uh, who are like-minded to enable us realize our goals, whether it's in the public sector or it's in the, in the, in the private sector or also in the society as a whole. And so more recently, uh, one of the projects that I'd like to talk about is the KCB M-Pesa, uh, this journey that we started in the year 2015 uh, to enable us to deepen our financial inclusion in the country. Uh, so through this channel, uh, or um, just to take cognizance of our international visitors, so the KCB M-Pesa basically is a partnership between the bank and a telecommunication sector whereby we, uh, we are able to provide credit and uh, credit access facilities uh, to our clients who are not necessarily banked with us. Uh, so it has been a very good uh, a platform that we have been able to use to facilitate to provide that credit through the phone without them walking to our branches. So we are able to evaluate and to be able to provide that. So through this channel, so far, we have been able to, to disperse uh, more than 20 billion worth of, uh, uh, of, 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 of loans to Kenyans. Uh, that's USD, I'm giving a USD number, uh, so to include some of the vulnerable uh, uh, individuals and those who may not be able to walk to our branches or may never come to get facilities from us. Through the KCB Foundation also, which is our social investment arm, we have also uh, incorporated programs uh, in, through our partners. And in 2018, uh, we'll identify the MasterCard Foundation program, which was key, dubbed uh, Young Africa Works, whereby uh, together with KCB and together with MasterCard, uh, we, we are working on ensuring that 5 million young people will be able to ac access dignified work through expanding technical vocation, uh, working readiness skills that are critical to the economic growth, especially for their youth and how do we make our youth more productive in the country. So this project which is being implemented is currently under implementation has 114,000 beneficiaries and these support various sectors uh, these are uh, the, the agricultural sector, they support the manufacturing sector and the construction sector. So we identified this sector in line with what we saw were the key, key things, what were gaps that were required in the economy where the youth can play a critical role and be productive and earn a decent income even as they operate in this sector. So it, we are hoping that even as we look ahead that uh, through this program, we shall be able to create 1.5 million jobs over the next five years uh, so that it can be able to be a source of income, source, source of uh, entrepreneurship, and source of building up the economy uh, for Kenya over that period. So as a bank, we believe that uh, Africa's solution in our quest for development is important, but at the same time, even as we look at our business success, 
how do we make sure that we coordinate that with the society's success? And therefore, uh, also through uh, this program, uh, we, I mean, sorry, through, not through the, uh, the, the Africa Work Programs, but also through our annuity program. As you had um, uh, Dr. Njenga talking about the roads, uh, the PPPs that we have to, to build up all the big roads. So KCB is also very much involved in these annuity programs that we work together with the National Treasury on some of the large infrastructure projects that we are doing uh, in the country, Kenya. So this program basically means that then we have to work together in terms of providing the funding shortfalls, but at the same time from the public side, they're able to provide the expertise that is required to run that program. So in summary, what I would like to say is that, uh, uh, that uh, public-private partnership is something that is doable. But again, we need to step up uh, given what we have gone through uh, at the moment through the pandemic, uh, because it's, it's now more important than ever looking at the sustainable development goals that need to be achieved in the next 10 years. We have the climate change issues and challenges that are ongoing and we need to address each one of them. And also looking at our society that the gap between the rich, rich and the poor continues to grow. So how do we ensure that uh, we are able to tackle all these uh, challenges in a nutshell using public-private partnerships so that we can accelerate and scale some of these programs so that we can see quick results? I think the results have not been coming up as fast as people would have liked, and therefore you find there's a lot of hopelessness. But how then do we play our key role, both the public and the private sector, so that we can bring our synergies together to accelerate some of these things that we have been talking about for years, given what we have gone through the pandemic, so that we can start having a very big success stories to speak about in another decade that is coming. So I'll hand over now to the moderator, Carol, and uh, I'll still be with you. Uh, so as we listen to the other panelists, and in case of anything, I'll be able to address them. Over to you, Carol. Thank you. Judith, thank you very much. That was quite interesting to see what KCB is doing within the region and how it's participating in PPPs. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you. And we look forward to engaging more with you once we open the panels and once we open the, chat, the q and A. So we'll now move on to the panelist session. And what I want to do is I'll introduce, rather than read all the panelist bios, as and when I call on a panelist to just give us their insights on this topic, I will read out their bio. And so by the end, by the time we get to the fourth panelist, we should have gotten an idea of who is in the room. But just in terms of names, we've got Dr. Peter Kimboa, who's the founder of the CEO Summit in Uganda. And then we've got Peter Varndell, who's the CEO of uh, NEPAD Business Foundation. We've also got Dr. Abdul Mukhtar, who's the Director for Industrial and Trade Development at the African Development Bank. And we have Ms. Elizabeth Jenga, who's the Acting Business Development Director at Kenjin. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. If you have got any questions, please put them on the Q&A button, and then we'll be able to hopefully get to a level where we'll be able to pull out questions to ask our panelists. So um, in no particular order of importance, we're starting with Dr. Dr. Peter Kimboa, who's fondly known to those of us who know him well as PK. And Dr. Peter Kimboa describes himself as a leadership catalyst, a talent optimization coach, a strategy execution expert, an author, and a futurist. He is the founder and team leader of the CEO Summit, which is a founder and team leader of the CEO Apprenticeship Program, which is jointly conducted with the Strathmore University Business School. He's a co-founder and trustee of the League of East African Directors, and he's the managing partner at IFE Consultants Limited in Uganda. He's a board member of several, he's an advisor as well as a non-executive director of several boards in Uganda, including ESCOM and Equity Bank. So without further ado, I just want to hear from TK and I'll give him a leading question. And what we want to hear from PK, I beg your pardon, is based on the concept of creating shared value, which TK, which, uh, TK really articulated well, what's the difference between shared value and corporate social responsibility, PK? 
thanks very much, Carol. And I would like also to thank all the uh, previous speakers' uh, wonderful uh, contribution they have made, starting with you, Carol, the background you have given us on partnership, uh, public-private partnership, and also adding something more, public-private and civil society partnership. Uh, T.K. Bernard, thanks very much for uh, giving us the conceptual background and also showing us that the obstacle is the way. I think there's going to be a lot more actions. I thank Dr. Njenga for raising the challenges that we still have to overcome. And also Judith for outlining what we call at the CEO Summit, show and tell. That it means that whatever you do, share it with others. Thanks very much, Judith, for sharing the example. Now, uh, coming to the uh, difference between corporate social responsibility and also shared value. Uh, one is, uh, first of all, the other one is corporate social responsibility. The word, keyword there is responsibility. You are responding to pressure. Citizen activism. Government does, fears you, probably. Government mistrusts you. Government holds you in suspicion. Therefore, you do a quick response for photo opportunity. There are a number of companies in East Africa which fall in the four categories. Number one, there are those who don't know that they don't know that this thing doesn't exist. There are also those who know, but won't practice anything to do with uh, reconceiving the intersection between uh, social progress and economic progress. There are those who know, but they won't do. There are those who know, but they only do piecemeal work. They do just a little. And there are those who are fully engaged. There are those who are fully engaged. And when we talk about shared value, we are talking about a long-term partnership. When we talk about corporate social responsibility, we are talking about short-termism, photo opportunity that we have done a little in contributing something. According to corporate social responsibility advocates, this is a cost to the organization or to the business. Corporate social responsibility is a cost. However, corporate social shared value is actually an investment. So the difference is cost and investment. The difference is about benefit relative to cost. Now, we, if you look at uh, corporate social responsibility, we usually see it as a, a handshake. Shared value is an embrace. It's a long-term engagement. The strategy and execution of a strategy of a business is at, at the center is what we call purpose. And these are the institutions that we have in much of not much of Africa, but in a number of places in Africa where we have what you call purpose-first companies. The purpose is at the center of the business endeavor. It's an identification, recognition that you are going to build more trust and you are going to create more business opportunity by responding effectively to societal needs. Uh, the other thing about corporate social responsibility is that it has got a narrow view of uh, value creation. Corporate social responsibility has a narrow view of value creation. It has got a very narrow approach. Shared value has an expanded scope of creating and capturing and delivering value on a sustainable basis. Corporate social responsibility has, again, as I, I mentioned, that the reason they participate is simply because of holding at bay the citizen activism and the government suspicion and all that kind of stuff. Now, with the shared value, we are looking at engagement across profit and not profit barriers or profit and non-profit boundaries. So this is about corporate social responsibility and shared value. Shared value is an embrace, it's a commitment. Uh, I would like to use the example of His Highness, the other Khan, talking about corporate social responsibility to leaders at El Sheikh a uh, conference that was about three years ago in Egypt. And he said, we need to be Africans. And he says that if we are going to be masters of our own destiny, we should control and manage the ideas that will shape that destiny. Aga Khan goes further. And he says, the African kitchen, you have got four stones. The one is government. The other one is the private sector. The other one is civil society. You cannot eat in Africa unless you have those four stones. Because that's, what, that's where fire is made. Uh, the, the, the other example he gave is the African stool. If you, you, you get a visitor in Africa, sits on a stool which has three legs, and the first leg is government. The second one is private sector. And the third is 
civil society. So this is a complete engagement that calls for collective action and harnessing productive synergies. So the, the, the real difference around here also is in terms of uh, the collective impact. Because when we get together, uh, the three entities, the ones who make the African stove and the ones who make the, the African kitchen, what do we do? We have to create a common agenda. That's number one. Number two, we have to have shared measurement. We need to be able to, to look at the same thing and measure it. Then we also have to have constant communication, constant communication on the way, and reinforcing activities that support each other so that we all know what the other is doing. We know who is responsible for this. We know who is accountable for this. We know who must be consulted, whose support we need. The other thing is we need to know what's going on. We need to know what the trends are in the communities, in civil society. But what, is, what are the trends in government? in terms of partnerships and so on, and also with the public sector. Then we need to have a real solid backbone, backbone support of uh, a secretariat of, uh, like for instance in Uganda, what we have is uh, the CEO summit. And at the CEO summit, what we have done really is we have uh, selected different CEOs and placed them in clusters. And each of the clusters is mapped to a, a, a frequently ignored social problem. Like, for instance, water, environment, we have uh, agriculture, we have uh, tourism, we have power, and all those type of things, and infrastructure. So these 10 CEOs work together, like I said, common agenda, reinforcing activities, shared measurement, constant communication, and a shared backbone. So that's what I can say, Carol, that uh, the difference is one is just a responsibility, a one-off photo opportunity without any long-term commitment. The other one is long-term and it's an embrace. Thank you very much, Carol. Okay, that was very enlightening. I actually hadn't known the difference between the two and I always learn something from you each time I engage with you. Thanks for that. In your last three minutes, could you just tell us an example of a, a successful PPP in the Ugandan context? And just before you answer, I'd just like to ask the other panelists that to please engage people on the chat button. There's two, a couple of questions coming in the Q&A button. So I'd like to ask, you know, Peter, Dr. Abdul Mukhtar, TK, if you can, Elizabeth Jenga, there's some interesting stuff coming through on the Q&A and the chat. So if we can keep two levels of engagement going as we, as we proceed. PK? Yes, we, we have a couple of them. Uh, and uh, we, we have a number of them. Uh, we've got East African Breweries, uh, where I think East African Breweries is engaging uh, the farmers and uh, working also with the agricultural extension officers, but also at the bottom of the pyramid are also what you call civil, sub, civil society groups like faith-based organizations, working to mobilize farmers, small-scale farmers, creating what you call champion, uh, champion farmers who make uh, the necessary connections and engagement with the, the super connector who is uh, East African Brewers or UBL. Uh, and that has created what you would call uh, one, first of all, is the, 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 the are new products. We have reconceived new product lines and created the new markets. And secondly, is also to work around the value chain of the brewery and creating new steps now in the area of procurement, in the area of uh, marketing, uh, in the area of finance, uh, connecting a real serious value chain from brewery right down to the lowest farmer. Uh, growing cassava, barley, and also sorghum. Uh, then we have uh, we have also done work. I, I don't want to talk about the Equity Bank because then uh, I don't know whether it's conflict of interest or not. But uh, I, uh, I'm a board member. Equity Equity has got a lot of that, especially in the area of health, humanity, uh, and also in terms of education and supporting. So that's one successful uh, PPP. Uh, in the area of uh, humanity, in the area of uh, 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 livelihoods and, and also securing lives. We, we've got also something working on in Uganda uh, where we, I think it's been field tested in the post COVID or COVID response plan, the COVID response team. Uh, corporate leaders in Uganda have got together uh, and they, they, they have built a common agenda, not only about uh, doing what you call emergency response, but now trying to create a long term drawn out program built upon the CEO summit that we need to work on these sectors and see what actions we can work on together and create collective impact as a company or rather as companies and private sector entities. Thank you very much, Carol. 
Fantastic, PK. Yes, you're, you are allowed, we call that in social media a shameless plug when you bring in the equity bank. That's something that you're proudly associated with and we thank you for that. Peter Vandell, Judith Cidio, the Ambotika Barnard. There's lots of questions coming in the Q&A section of this webinar. Please let's make this as engaging a webinar as possible. If you can try and answer some of those questions, I'd be eternally grateful. PK, I'd like you to also please throw in your, your two cents in the Q&A section of the, uh, of the webinar. My next panelist is um, Peter Varndell. I'd like to ask Peter to just turn on his mic. There we are. He's, uh, and Peter Varndell was appointed as the Chief Executive Officer of the NEPAD Business Foundation on 17th of September, 2018. He's been with the NEPAD Business Foundation since 2014, though. In his previous capacity as program manager for the Africa in Infrastructure Desk, his role involved providing leadership and technical expertise to help deliver the North-South Corridor Rail Project. This project is the cooperative efforts of seven rail operators in the SADC region, working together to increase intra-Africa trade. By training, Peter is a chartered civil engineer with 17 years of experience in infrastructure development. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over the mic, virtual mic to Peter Vandel. And Peter, I want you to kick off your discussion in terms of telling us how have you created PPPs within the NEPAD um, initiative? And panelists, please, please engage our, our participants. We've got lots of participants. Please engage our participants in the Q&A section. Go ahead. Thanks, Carol, and, and thanks to the team for, for including us in this conversation. Um, as I mentioned to you before, Carol, we take a slightly different take on, on what most people take on a PPP. Um, you know, I think really what I'd like to do is, is build on what was already said by, by Dr. Kimbo in terms of you know, how you create these, these partnerships uh, at an early stage between, between government and, and, uh, and business. Um, so I think maybe just by starting, uh, let's just say that there's a massive opportunity as it stands right now. I think uh, our observation is that, you know, whilst COVID has been catastrophic for, for our economies, it's also created a huge opportunity for collaboration. And, and certainly from, from our experience over the last few months, never before have I, has cooperation between business and, and uh, between businesses and businesses and between businesses and the private sector been stronger and more focused and, and, and hopefully we can build on this and, and, and use this as a platform and an opportunity to, to solve some of the longer term issues that have always been on the table that, that people have been working on. Um, so within that sort of introduction, you know, the, the NEPA Business Foundation model is, is something reasonably unique, I believe. Um, you know, we were created 10, 15 years ago when the African Union created the NEPAD agency at the time, now the AUDA NEPAD. And our goal was simply to mobilize private sector support for government endorsed initiatives. So you'll be aware that there are a number of continental frameworks, plans, be it in infrastructure, be it in health, be it in education, be it in agriculture. Um, and really what we were trying to find was the intersection between, you know, which of these programs and projects make sense for the growth of businesses on the one hand, and on the other hand, which of them present good business opportunities for a private sector to participate and be successful in. Um, and, you know, we haven't found that, that sort of intersection between, between public and private then to mobilize private sector resources then to support the implementation. Um, you know, so when we talk about mobilizing private sector, we're talking about anything from financial resources to expertise, to advice, to information. Um, and I guess the, the real value that we've created over time is to create a number of programmatic sector-based public-private collaborations, where it's a, a jointly co-chaired arrangement between business and, and particular government stakeholders with the view of supporting the governments to, you know, to, to do things that they want to do. So we don't see it as a lobby organization. We don't see it as somebody looking for different stuff. We really want to support that what is government endorsed because it's obviously easier, easier to then you know, create the political will that we all talked about earlier. So, you know, just, just take what's already endorsed. Um, you know, so really our role has been to act as a catalyst, what we typical role is program management facilitation. But the idea is to, to harness the full ecosystem of who has an interest in a specific program or project. 
So whilst we, we get the support from, from businesses, we also importantly have relationships with, um, with the donors and the development finance institutions. And, and we try to leverage their capacity and their resources to do the, the heavy lifting work. You know, if there's feasibility studies or, or work that needs to be done, you know, we, we try to find that alignment. And obviously there's long-term uh, shared interest in the sense that you know, they're, they're trying to support various initiatives and create investments for themselves in the long run. Um, so, you know, these public-private collab collaborations, I mean, just to give you a bit of a, a sense, I mean, we have, you mentioned in the introduction, the North South Rail Corridor Project. That's, that's what's known as a PETA project. It's one of the priority infrastructure projects for Africa. It's a SADC, uh, Southern Africa master plan project. And one that, you know, businesses along the route between South Africa and Zambia DRC desperately want to work because it makes sense for their um, movement of bulk goods along, you know, to, to the to the ports that they're trying to get stuff to. So we've been involved in that quite heavily. More recently, very involved in, in the natural gas space. Again, creating a, a similar initiative around partnering around creating the, the local opportunities, the local economic opportunities that that will be realized from the natural gas. Um, you know, most of it will be exported to international markets, but you know, how do we sort of recognize that there are major demand nodes in our own region and how do we then create solutions to, to drive that? So we see that as a major opportunity um, and within it, there'll be major opportunities for PPPs, I'm sure. Similarly in South Africa, um, you know, we, we, we host a couple of initiatives in the water space um, partnerships between big industrial water users and the Department of Water and uh, supporting them on, on implementing the National Water Plan. Um, we have partnerships with mining companies and the Department of Water on the just energy transition, the just uh, you know, the transition away from coal. But all of them share exactly what, what our previous colleagues said. There's a shared vision and a shared goal, um, which from our side always stems from what does the government want to do first? And then you know, to create from their opportunities. Um, you know, maybe in our small way, we try to play a role in, in, in formalizing PPPs in the sense that we have uh, had PPP training internally. Um, we delivered the World Bank training and I think over the last couple of years delivered up to over 550 people across the continent that have taken, taken that course. So there, there is a lot of movement towards capacitating um, key sponsors. Um, in terms of PPPs themselves, you know, I'm not going to get into the, the details of PPPs. I think it's largely acknowledged that that um, you know PPPs are a viable alternative, and it's something that should be considered. I think you know from from a very macro level, the challenge that we see is that there appears to be a difficulty in, in terms of prioritizing and preparing these these types of transactions for for the market. And similarly, you know, what West uh, you know private sector has from time to time try to step up and deliver unsolicited bids as an alternative to try and get through that, that preparation hurdle. You know, I think uh, success on unsolicited bids is probably also very, very limited. You know, I think uh, it's difficult for governments to, to receive and, and, to, and to, to, to deal with. Yeah, so, you know, coming back to the role, we really think that the constraint within PPPs comes back to identifying and preparing them properly such that business can participate. And, you know, we, we really believe in, you know, the, we're talking shared value here. We believe in the creation of shared value around prioritizing which projects can be done. And then stepping in in some shape or form to contribute to the, to the preparation of these, uh, of these PPPs such that they can come to market. You know, the, the, the enduring sort of comment from me is always as a, I guess, as an ex-practitioner in infrastructure space is, you know, there's no short, 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 uh, short steps to getting there. You know, you have to go through a process. It's time. It's time consuming. It's, uh, it requires a lot of resourcing. It requires a lot of preparation. A lot of commitment. Um, so I think the people need to recognise that, but then find a way to contribute to to making sure that that these kind of projects do come to to market. Um, so I'll stop there, uh, Carol. Just to hopefully you've got a bit of a sense of of how we how we create what we call early stage public private um, collaborations as opposed to the, what we're talking more about the legal and structuring uh, as, as, a, as an investment model. Thank you very much, Peter. You actually came in bang on time at 10 minutes. So thank you very much. For that. <laughs> so Peter, there's a question here from Anne Wangalachi, the Q&A section. I'd like to kindly request if you can answer her in the Q&A section, if you just look there. And um, Judith CD, I'd like you to request, to request that you answer the question from Pius Nunda. 
So Judith, if you just look in the Q&A section and just click answer, if you could kindly respond to Pius's question. Excellent. Thank you so much, Peter. I really appreciate your insights on that, particularly what's going on down south in South Africa. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Abdu Mukhtar. And in terms of background, Dr. Abdu Mukhtar joined the African Development Bank in September 2017 as the Director of Industrial and Trade Development Department. In that role, he actually oversees the AFDB's industrialization strategy across the African continent. And he's leading teams in industrial policy, <coughs> trade development, investment climate, and non-sovereign operations. Prior to joining the AFDB, Dr. Mukta was actually the group chief strategy officer of the Dangote Group of Industries in Nigeria from 2014 to 2017. He actually started his career as a medical officer in the Ministry of Health in Kano in 1991. So this is doctor of medicine and not doctor of PhD, just FYI, okay? So without further ado, what I'd like to do is uh, welcome Dr. Abdul Mukhtar into the panel. And Dr. Mukhtar, maybe you can start by telling us how, what role DFI, such as the African Development Bank, can play in enhancing people <clears throat> in Africa. Thank you, uh, Carol. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, let me join my fellow panelists to really thank the Strathmore University Business School and the uh, Shared Value Africa uh, Initiative for really organizing this very timely seminar. You know, we've always been struggling with issues of financing, of infrastructure. Uh, what COVID has done is really just to uh, amplify uh, the needs in, in that sector. As uh, we estimate in the bank, Africa Development Bank, uh, COVID has really uh, caused the loss of at least 10 years of economic growth across the continent. So this is how huge the problem is. And we're still counting. We really don't know what the long-term impacts are. Uh, so this is a time to really think uh, with innovation, uh, to think about new ways uh, of financing, uh, of uh, you know, bridging the development gaps uh, and, and issues that we face on the continent. And so this is calls for new thinking. We, we believe strongly in the bank that uh, PPPs uh, should be one of the ways through which uh, you know, we can look at it more critically and become more serious about it. We estimate in the bank that from now till 2025, uh, we need a, at least Africa needs at an estimated 130 to 170 billion dollars, US dollars, uh, to uh, bridge in the gap, existing gap, but also to provide the infrastructure that is needed uh, across the continent. So this is huge. Now, if you look at the private sector, uh, so far, you know, uh, the money invested by the private sector in infrastructure. Uh, it's still small, uh, it's growing. So in 2014, uh, about $3 billion from the private sector into infrastructure investments. Um, in 2018, it's about $12 billion. So you can say, well, it's uh, multiplied by four, but if you look at it, $12 billion compared to what is required uh, overall on the continent is really small. Uh, so there is absolute need to find ways to uh, increase this uh, and make, make it the cornerstone for infrastructure development. Now, the question that uh, usually first question to ask is, are African countries ready really for PPPs? You know, we talk about political will and uh, we need all of that. Uh, and, and primarily, you know, infrastructure is mostly uh, provided through public financing. Uh, so PPPs, you know, for whatever reason, you know, is taking, is uh, slow in taking off. Uh, African countries ready. So when we look at uh, what's going on now, you, you see about out of the 54 African countries, about 33 countries, uh, they have some law or policy uh, guiding uh, establishment of PPPs and a PPP unit. Uh, about six countries uh, right now, they have either the law or policy uh, without the unit. So uh, people understand the need to have like the right framework, the, the right laws and the right regulations. But if you look at it in terms of deal flow, uh, because again, you know, setting the framework does not necessarily translate into getting PPPs done, uh, in terms of pipeline is still slow. You know, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the, and if you look at global PPP uh, investments, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for only 5% uh, of total PPP investments. Uh, that is from 1999 to 2019, the last uh, 10 years or so. So 5% is really small, small. And if you look at it, still, it is concentrated in only about five countries. So 50% of the PPPs in Africa are in uh, South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Morocco, and Ghana. You know, many of the other countries, you know, you see a long list of pipeline and, and, and ambitions and, and what they want to do, but really that does not translate into uh, doing things. So uh, development finance institutions like the ADB, what role can we play? Now, 
uh, we look at it at PPP, it's like, it's like a marriage, right, between public and private. Sometimes you need like a matchmaker, uh, somebody in between to say, look, come together, you know, how do I make this work? You know, what are the key issues? So the role that we see for, for DFIs, and, and we are very active in this field, but so are some of our sister DFIs, like the World Bank Group, uh, the European Investment Bank, the EBRD, and, and many of the other DFIs are active in this field. Uh, the first one is really to make sure that the projects are well structured. Now, one of the major uh, issue, you know, when you dealing with private sector, you know, they're looking for value for money. Uh, they want investments that will bring some decent return. So the pro pro the projects have to be bankable. They need to be properly structured. So that upstream work that has to happen to make sure that the projects are done, uh, well structured, well designed, uh, with good feasibility studies. I think that's one of the roles that DFIs can and we are really focusing on because once you have a bankable structure. It's not that difficult to find a private sector entity that is willing to bring in the money. Uh, second, uh, also in terms of the financing, you know, the long tenor uh, that is also reasonably priced. You know, um, the DFIs, one of the things that we can do, you know, most of us have good rating. So the Africa Development Bank, for example, has a triple A rating. Uh, what that does, it gives us the opportunity to borrow very cheaply in the market and provide long-term finance. So we provide, you know, anything from 20 years, you know, uh, 50 years or so on some PPP projects. And by nature, PPP projects, you know, um, even the time that it takes to construct many of these projects is a long time. So you need long-term money, uh, but also you need like really low interest rate because at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to just uh, escalate the cost of this project. So this is one of the roles that the, the, the bank, the DFIs can provide. Um, third, uh, which is important, I think, is uh, mitigating risk of the investment uh, and other, uh, for, for investors and other lenders. And, you know, we have all sorts of instruments uh, in ADB and other DFIs uh, for, uh, to, guarantee, for, to provide guarantees and, and, and provide insurance, uh, risk covers and all of that. That is very important because again, then that decreases the cost of capital, you know, on the side of the, of the private sector. But one way also we do what we, what we do to mitigate risk is the political risk. You know, uh, when people deal with government, you know, um, I know there was a mention of trust and all of that, you know, um, you need uh, governments to stick to their word, uh, to respect contracts and all of that. So we, uh, DFIs, we have very good relationships often with governments. In the ADB, of course, you know, we are an African institution, the premier uh, DFI on the continent. So we have that respect, we have that connection. So we can nudge, you know, sometimes behind the, uh, the scenes to governments to, to respect, you know, the, the conditions uh, and to make sure that they, they do the right things. Uh, and then finally, of course, we provide the financing. So um, let me let come to specifically what the ADB, African Development Bank, is doing uh, in, the, in, the, in this regard. You know, I mentioned that we're the premier DFI. Uh, all of the 54 African countries are members, so you know we have that access. Um, we uh, have a development agenda that is around what we call the high fives. Uh, so it's feeding Africa through agriculture, uh, powering Africa through the provision of energy. Third one is industrializing Africa. The fourth one is integrating Africa uh, through regional integration initiatives. And then the last one is improving the quality of lives of Africans through education and healthcare. Now, what I say to people and what we say at the bank, look, if you want to industrialize, you need the right infrastructure. There will be no industrialization without infrastructure. You want to feed people in Africa, you want to focus on agriculture, you know, you need to uh, do large scale agri, you know, to create uh, processing zones. Uh, when farmers in rural areas produce the food, they need uh, they have good roads, uh, good infrastructure to transport the goods to the consumers in the country and maybe even to export. So this is really, uh, it's important. You know, you want to educate, we want to educate our children very well in the era of COVID with online education. You need uh, ICT infrastructure to be in place to, be, to do that. So uh, infrastructure is at the heart of what we do at the African Development Bank because it has this um, catalytic impact on, on the entire development uh, space. We have in the last uh, 10 years or so uh, supported about 41 PPP projects in about uh, 55 African countries. Uh, most of it, 94% is in the transport and energy sector. Uh, we spent about $4 billion in, the, in these projects, about $3 billion in direct financing into the projects, about $1 billion in doing the upstream work, you know, so helping with feasibility, helping with structuring, and we have uh, all sorts of facilities in the bank, including uh, NEPAD uh, project preparation facility that we would do together with, uh, with, with NEPAD. And I see that uh, one of my colleagues here is from NEPAD, you know, so we use that facility to help countries to prepare projects uh, and so on. 
So I will uh, close by citing just a few uh, projects that we've supported. Uh, and, and, and really, for me, it's not the project. is The lesson here is what makes this project successful. You know, so what are the key success factors? So the projects I will mention, uh, there is a Dakar, Jamniado Toll Highway. Now, if you look at it, uh, this is uh, one of the first uh, uh, PPP toll roads in Africa, uh, outside South Africa, uh, that has been doing this for a while. It's a 32 kilometer road between Dakar uh, in Senegal that has 2.5 million people uh, living in it and the new economic hub in Senegal, uh, which is called the Minado. Uh, so that is a really good opportunity, you know, because people move from between the two countries. You know, it's really, uh, the link is really important for the country's economic development. So uh, in 2015, this road was completed through a PPP. Uh, it's uh, 32 kilometers, like I said, you know, it allows 45,000 vehicles to move between these two cities. Uh, before the road, you know, it would take an average of about two hours to move between the two cities. With this road now, you can go uh, in 15, uh, maximum 30 minutes. Um, you know, it reduced congestion, but also pollution. Um, it is very, very successful. You know, it generates about $100,000 uh, a day uh, in, in revenues. Uh, has created almost a thousand jobs. You know, so the reason why this was successful is look a couple of things. One, there is a political commitment, the will. You know, we always say that that was a political will. You know, the government of Senegal really wanted to do this. They had their full backing. They respected the rules. They set up the laws and made sure everything happened. Uh, but secondly, there is also public confidence. So there was enough background work done to really just you know let people know uh, that this is important. Uh, and tied to that, of course, the stakeholder engagement. You know, when you do a road, you have to relocate people, you know, so, and, and, and you don't want, you know, people complaining. You don't want them to really want to say, oh, well, this is good for us. You know, it's going to create more opportunities. So that stakeholder engagement at the onset is very, very important. And then finally, uh, feasibility study was solid. It was done very well. And that was a great uh, policy initiative. So that was, that's, that's one. Uh, another one that I will mention is uh, Ozazate uh, Nuru one and two solar projects in Morocco. Uh, this is actually the, the largest concentrated solar power uh, plant in the world. Uh, it's 510 megawatts uh, of power in stage one, and then they said 72 megawatts of, uh, in stage two. It's a $2.5 billion project. Uh, the private sector is uh, um, in, in, uh, ACWA Power with the Spanish consortium on the private side. On the, on the government side is a Moroccan agency for sustainable energy. It has crushed down the cost of power in Morocco significantly. Um, uh, which is really, uh, really important. Uh, one of the uh, end games that you, you want to see in PPPs. I would stop here. I think I'm coming to the end of my time, but I really think that uh, there are so many lessons uh, to learn here and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Before. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mukhtar. You've actually put a lot of names and numbers behind the PPP projects in Africa, and we're very grateful for that. I'll give you another opportunity when we open it up to the Q&A section, but thank you very much for for those really detailed, that detailed piece of information. Okay, our last panelist is Ms. Elizabeth Jenga, and she is um, she's currently working with Kenjin. In, in, she's currently the Acting Business Development Manager at Kenjin, and she's a well-skilled energy strategy and power projects planning, appraisal, and financing expert with a keen interest in public policy. For those that may not be from Kenya, Kenjin is Kenya's largest electricity generating company. It's listed on the Nairobi Stock Exchange. So she's, she's currently, um, her current responsibilities include an exciting challenge and mandate of implementing Kenya's power generation capacity expansion strategy, right from ideation of suitable power projects, appraisal of the same, procurement of power, of power consultants and contractors and ensuring that she drives the implementation of Kenjen's first public-private partnership project, which I will be calling on her to talk a little bit more about. Elizabeth, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Caro. And thank you to my fellow panelists and participants for finding time this afternoon Yes, Cara, we are in the process of implementing uh, what will be our first public-private partnership. It's a geothermal project. And so far, we have walked half the journey. We are in the procurement phase. We have completed the shortlisting uh, phase. 
and our shortlist of bidders appeared in the Kenya Gazette in May. So we just we are just about to launch the final procurement phase. And 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 that Carol, you know, puts us puts us in a in a, in a very good space to share with uh, our participants the lessons that we have learned, because we have learned. And one of the lessons that we have learned so far, and um, which is very, very close to my heart, because I know it really works and will make the difference, is ensure that your documentations are proper, good quality documents. Because good quality documents communicates to the bidders, to the market on your behalf. It shows your level of preparedness. It shows your level of competence. It shows, you know, how well you understand your own transaction before you can talk to the market. And now stepping back a little bit to the Kenyan uh, transaction, of course, all infrastructure projects are heavy capital investments. They're expensive. So what we are looking at at Kenyan is probably an investment of about $400 million. And, and that's, that's significant by any standard. And that signals to the market the level, the kind of investors that you're looking at. And I mean, I would say that we are looking at, you know, sophisticated investors. They have to put in that capital. They are investors, they're business people, they need their money back. And therefore they will also come along with sophisticated advisors. Uh, they will come with, you know, with the renowned, you know, legal firms in the, in the world. So on the public sector side, can you engage these sophisticated investors with their very well experienced and very high skilled advisors and hold that conversation to the very end? And looking at public private partnerships, their product is a public service. And you know, after all is said and done, all of us are consumers of that product. We shall be the ones using the the roads, you know, the water, the healthcare system, the power. So you want to ensure that on the public sector side, that you're also well skilled to ensure that you're not, you know, the weaker partner. You're not the weak beginning party on the table and that you do not end up with a transaction that is so negatively skilled towards the, pub, the, the, the public sector, such that we end up with a public sector outcry and as far, especially if it is not affordable. And that lends itself to the importance of capacity building. And capacity building here is very, very critical. And it is not just capacity building your technical staff. It is capacity building your technical staff, the executives, and all the way to the policy makers, because the PPP transactions cut across you know, when you look at the PPP Act, the final approvals are by the cabinet. So you want to ensure that you'll be able to communicate and people will be able to understand what you're communicating because then you'll get your approvals. So we, we have invested in capacity building, um, both you know, our staff, and I know the National Treasury has also invested in capacity building around the policymakers and all the, you know, the public sector nodes and that is very critical for approval. The third critical success factor from where I sit is make sure that you have very good transaction advisors. Please do a very good job of hiring your transaction advisors and especially if you're doing the PPP transaction for the first time. I like telling my colleagues that it is different because with all fairness, Kenyan has implemented very huge power projects but not using the PPPs. And for us, it was a little bit humbling when we realized that we needed transaction advisors because then we realized it's a different, I mean, it's a, it's a, different, it's a different transaction. It's not your typical, you know, normal procurement using the rules and the law that we are used to. Now, the transaction advisors will hold your hand in terms of conducting a feasibility study. You need a very robust feasibility study because the feasibility study will still have to be approved, you know, all the way by the PPP committee at the National Treasury. And the, they have checklist of what they look at. So your transaction advisor will help you structure a robust, a bankable, a viable feasibility study. Your transaction advisors will also help you walk the road of making sure that the documents that you're putting to the bidders during the procurement phase are also robust. And by the way, when you have a robust feasibility study, your documents are well prepared, you're more likely to get you know, a good product for the public sector. 
you know, for all of us. The other key success factors is you have to manage the stakeholders. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a public sector procurement, so it's not a private transaction. The consumer is a public. And we know that, you know, community agitation, uh, citizenly um, agitation can stop your transaction and they will. So the transaction has to be very well understood. Make sure that your communication team is putting, you know, the right vibe, you know, to the public sector, creating awareness and building on the benefits of the PPP. And of course, the fact that is a, is a public transaction, it is governed by the public law and the regulations. So it is obviously very critical to ensure fidelity to law, that we ensure you know, compliance, all the legal provisions that are there, that we are ticking the boxes, and especially as far as disclosure is concerned. And um, finally, and also very critical and very important, it just makes sure that we are transparent in our procurement processes. Um, Dr. Jenga touched on the rent seeking, and I can see some questions coming in on vested interests. Um, and I can say that the PPP Act, as far as the disclosure is concerned, is very elaborate. It's not a private transaction. Once you shortlist your bidders, you have to put them in the Kenya Gazette so that everybody can see, oh, these are the people who are working on the, with Kenjan on the Geolamo PPP. Are these bidders uh, qualified? Can we you know, probably do an internet search? Are they credible bidders? And, um, but I also like to challenge the private sector uh, because as I mean, in the, in the, I'm the public sector. And when people talk of rent seeking and corruption, we are linked to the public sector. And I like to argue that it, it takes two to tangle. And we all know how much pressure and power and influence interest groups can weigh on the system. So if we have to slay the corruption um, in, the, in, in the public sector and the PPP, can we team up together, both the private on the public sector and, you know, and, and fizzle out those vested interests that one of the question is addressing. And then perhaps we can have a good, a successful PPP program that will deliver value to the public sector. And I'd like to stop at that point, Caro, and hand, uh, hand over back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Actually, you, you walked us through a step-by-step -step process of how our PPP is brought to life. So very enlightening and we really appreciate your, 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 uh, your inputs. So we've now gotten our feedback from all the panelists and um, what I'd like to do is now open this up to uh, questions from yourselves. Peter Vandal, if you could just turn on your camera, there's an interesting question that's come through on the Q&A and uh, maybe I can read it out to you. It's coming from Anne Wangalachi and Peter, drawing on your experience, Anne Wangalachi is asking government support mechanisms need to be strengthened in order to spur increased private sector investments. Any thoughts on global or African best practices based on your experience? Uh, anybody else wants to ask a question? Just raise your hand. If you go to your name, put raise hand and I'll come to you. Peter? Yeah, Carol, I'm, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure I understand the, 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 the question correctly, but I mean, I guess the idea is that, you know, how do we provide additional capacity support to governments. And, you know, I, I guess there are a number of initiatives that already do that, be it from donor programs to DFI programs to, to the, the type of way that we're working currently. Um, but I guess typically they all revolve around um, additional capacity. I mean, it's, you know, you, there's obviously training as well as the one part you can get in part capacity but we we believe that you know training in its own right is probably not sufficient you, you need some sort of mentoring i guess some sort of support uh, as projects uh, progress um you know th there was discussion now about transaction advisors you know so if you don't have the skills internally you can procure them i mean there, there's there are incredibly strong transaction advisors around um, so I guess that is another way to, to support uh, government and you just need one or two strong people to, to manage that team and appoint them and, and I guess trust that they, they have your, your interests at heart as, as the project sponsor. And then there's the model which you know, we're trying to play our small role in a different way. And again, it's just, it, it all comes down to additional hands and feet just to try and, and drive these projects forward. So I'm not sure that that necessarily answers the question, but 
you know, I think um, there are a number of different ways of people working and all trying to support in some shape or form. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, maybe I want uh, Elizabeth Jenga to answer. This was an earlier question raised by Leonard Mudachi, and he was, so based on your experience, Elizabeth, he's talking about the privatization bill in 2013 and the PPP Act in 2017 are stumbling blocks to the implementation of both privatization and PPPs. So how would you propose we overcome that stumbling block in your experience at Kenjin? He says the will is there, but the bureaucracy is a big hindrance. Could you speak a little bit about your experience in the bureaucratic space? And well, thank you, Carol. I can I can speak to the PPP mm. uh, and the PPP Act. What I know and I'm sure is that the PPP Act has put in place disclosure mechanism. It cannot be a private transaction because right from the time a PPP project is approved, it is published. Mm. And, and you know, it's published for that it has been approved for implementation as a public-private partnership project. Mm. And once you complete the feasibility study, again, the approval process uh, is all the way to the PPP committee. When you want to launch the procurement, it is open international competitive bidding. And therefore, everybody is invited to participate. And um, what, is, what, what I love most about the, the PPP Act disclosure requirements is that once you shortlist, you have to put it back to the papers that this is our shortlist of the PPP projects. And, and therefore, that in a way invites the public sector to also weigh in and comment. So because we are all consumers and we are all Kenyans and we are all interested you know, in checking how the, you know, the public sector is managing you know, our resources. So if, if, if I saw a farm uh, that has been shortlisted to implement a geothermal project and I know this farm, I mean, I can, I can always do a search and everybody is invited to do a search. And you know, we are all entitled to information and you can all protest if we want to protest. So I think, I think the call is on us as a public, you know, as, as a public to, you know, to also get interested in these transactions, even if we are not investors, but as consumers and learn to question because the constitution empowers, that's where there's public participation all the way. And, 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 and you know, once we get into the next round of procurement, again, we'll be required to also make it very public. So we, there's no place to hide. Mm. But the people to put, you know, the contracting authorities and the public sector officers on their toes is still the public to question, to get, to get interested as empowered by the constitution on public participation. So the PPP Act ensures there's maximum disclosure. And us who are implementing, we know for sure there is nowhere to hide. So we are not hiding anything because we cannot hide it anywhere. So those bureaucratic stumbling blocks, we, we have not seen them. But what we know is that the PPP process is lengthy and it's complex. You have to go very many steps. But those steps are also necessary because they also offer checks and balances. And, um, but again, as I said, uh, it takes two to tangle. As in the public sector, we feel the pressure from the private sector because if there is corruption, it's not the public sector that is corrupt on its own. It's the it's it's private sector that approaches the public sector. And the private sector can also, you know, put in a lot of pressure on the public sector side. I'm always very, um, very, very open in defending the public sector because we get the pressure from the private sector. So it's teamwork. Um, yes, to that question, let us team together and ensure that these bureaucracies do not heed our, you know, efficient delivery of service. But as far as the PPP Act is concerned, it safeguards public interest as far as disclosure is concerned. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Abdul Mukhtar, there's a question on the Q&A, which I'm going to let you answer live. Dr. Abdul, you're there? And, yes, I'm uh, here, Carol. So there's a question by an anonymous attendee. We get worried when we see anonymous attendees, but this anonymous attendee asks, given the examples of successful PPPs that are shared on this platform, it seems that we're not short of bankable projects which are worthy of funding. What appears of concern is lack of consensus and common vision between the public sector, social rent seeking, 
and the private sector, which is profit driven. So anonymous attendee asks what frameworks and sustainable financing models can secure successful and more predictable PPPs. And if they do exist, why have these not been adopted? So um, thank you, Carol, Mr. Anonymous or Mrs. An Madam Anonymous or Mr. Anonymous. This is a very loaded question. And I think that you've, uh, at the beginning of the question, attempted to, to answer it. You know, um, uh, some of the issues really are cultural, uh, whatever cultural means. So it's not really straightforward uh, technical. You know, it, like technical issues are really easy to, uh, to overcome. When issues are just, you know, looking at uh, finances structures, um, and, and, and things like that, you know, anybody can just put the right structure. If it doesn't work, you know, we can always modify it. There are a lot of technical and financial wizards in the world or in Africa to, to make that happen. But the, the issue that you raised are really um, that uh, disconnect between the public and the expectations and so on. So really, I think it's an issue of alignment. Uh, people need to align, you know, yes, there are bankable projects, um, but still, uh, I like I said at the beginning, you know, so getting them bankable is also not that easy and what uh, happens in countries have like usually a huge pipeline of projects um, Senegal right now you know I think they have like 26 projects in their pipeline uh, I don't think that they have the capacity to execute even small uh, even countries that are small you see they have four five six projects in their pipeline I think that really um, the, the issue is just to align and, and just agree that maybe some of these projects will not cannot be financed by PPP and just pick projects where that are less contentious uh, again, this is a new uh, model of financing. So one of the things that you can do is to really just start with the easy ones, you know, pilot, you know, do one that everybody sees. Uh, and when you have a good example, uh, then you can showcase it, showcase it. And that's where, you know, institutions like us, one of the major roles that we can play and everyone around here is really just to showcase. So don't start with the difficult issues. It's just like an issue of negotiation, you know, start with the easy ones, then you get quick wins. Um, then people are happy and say, oh, it actually works. And then you now use that and transfer that example to another country or in the same country, try to do more. So in the ADB, for example, what we're trying to do is, as like I, I said, we're focusing mostly on transport power. You know, these are really big, you know, because they're, they're huge projects. That's where, you know, so if there's rent seeking issues, that's where usually, you know, the bigger the project, you know, the more the tendency to, to seek uh, rent seeking. Um, but then you, how about other sectors? So one of the things we are trying to do in the ADB is to say, look, you know, we know the content very well. Uh, we understand the health sector. We understand the water sector. We understand, you know, irrigation and education and all those other sectors that we're not doing PPPs, but we understand the sectors. We know we have the necessary relationship. So how do we then, you know, channel projects in those sectors into becoming PPPs? So uh, summary is there has to be an alignment. Uh, start with the easy ones. Uh, I don't maybe low hanging fruits is what I would call them, and just uh, use them. And 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 once you get one success, then you can build on that, and then it becomes sustainable over time. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mokhtar. Uh, PK, there's a discussion you started with Thuku that I want to sort of bring now into the public domain, um, and he says that you know you're talking about the whole issue of rent seeking. Where does it start? Public sector, private sector. And what he's, asked, he's saying is that he agrees that both sides, public sector and private sector, need to commit to curing the cancer. He's asking, what do you think will bring them to that point of convergence? What spark will ignite the convergent view? Uh, thanks very much, Carol. Uh, first of all, uh, I, uh, we need to uh, challenge a few assumptions behind our conversation this, uh, this afternoon, this morning, or this evening. When we talk about partnership, we are not talking about the dialogue that is going to be cordial. In my experience, working with the civil, civil society, working with the government, and trying to create uh, the, the, four, the three legs of a stool, it, 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 it calls for emotional courage. It calls for what you call tough empathy. And it calls for uh, what we usually call tough love. So it, 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 because a number of uh, players have got what you call, you know, operating with impunity, there's going to, there's going to be no sanctions in what they do. If you don't want this project moving, then you, you have to stay where you are with your funny moral compass. No, this is how we do things here in Africa. And so no, 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 that's not acceptable. I think the private sector especially has to lead the way. And we need to have sessions 
of breakthroughs in terms of show and tell. I, I remember uh, quite a long time back in the United Nations, there was an exercise which I, I participated in. It was supposed to be what they called the International Integrity Test. And they selected approximately 260 cities in the world. And they wanted to find out which city was most corrupt. And so, so they bought a number of wallets at that time with the cards and they put in a $20 bill or $20 bill. And they, they, they threw all these wallets in different places and so. But they made sure that wherever they were putting these wallets, uh, there was a place where one could go and report and hand it over. Now, uh, this exercise took uh, about two months. Wallets were strewn all over in New York and so on. Unfortunately for Africa, we only had Cairo and Johannesburg as the two cities where they were going to do the international integrity test. I will tell you something. I, can't, I mean, cities like Oslo, uh, Geneva, Zurich, uh, they, they performed so well. Gothenburg, Oslo, and so on. They, they did so well. Uh, of course, Africa didn't pass the test at all. Uh, we were among the last ones. Uh, and of course, uh, there was New York. New York was doing so badly. And so I think in Africa, we need to do something like that. The Afrobarometer report, as I shared earlier on, mentioned that Africa is losing approximately 150 billion. Now, 150 billion is a, is a combination of GDPs of about three, four countries. Uh, and according to uh, the Sina, the chief of the African Development Bank, the cost of uh, uh, you know, creating uh, a continental grid in terms of electricity and getting electricity to many villages in Africa would cost just about that. But we lose it in corruption. So I am really saying, and referring to what uh, Michelle Obama said, she said an open quote, do we settle for a world as it is? All we Africans ourselves work for a world as it should be. That's a, that's a question, a close quotation. That's a question we all have to ask ourselves in this very forum that we are in. We need to take actions. Today, the most fundamental skill post-pandemic is intentional learning, is the capacity to adopt. Humility is the new smart. So we, we have to face this reality and we ourselves, the Africans, we stop theorizing, we stop intellectualizing the issue, we get together and work around name and shame or show and tell. Thanks very much, Carl. Thanks, PK. I want to ask Judith Sidio Diambo to answer this last question. And then what I'm gonna do is just ask each of our uh, panelists to give their closing remarks. So Judith, I have a question here from Jerry Mokia who's asking, um, her concern on the financial benefits of PPPs in Africa. Um, she's asking, do we have local banks that are able to fund large scale infrastructure of PPPs in the region? Or are we still relying on international development banks and DFIs? What, what do you have to say to that? Uh, so uh, on that question, yes, of course, we still either we have to do a local consortium and of course, together, we need to work together with the, uh, the international banks and also the DFIs also come in handy. So for now, of course, uh, locally, we don't have on one bank that can be able to do a PPP on its own. So normally there's a lot of uh, collaboration and partnership across and that has been the trend uh, over the past 10 years. Okay, thank you so much for that. Thank you for that. So what I'll do is I'll go around and ask the panelists to give sort of their final remarks. And uh, Moses Simwawa, Simwawa from Zambia, as you're giving your final remarks, would like to hear, as you're giving your final remarks, he'd like to hear in what way we can help the public sector to run smoothly in collaboration with the private sector without the interference of political values. I think this is extremely uh, hopeful, but you know what, I'm just gonna leave it to you to answer, to, to give your views on that. So how can we help the public sector to run smoothly in collaboration with the private sector without interference of political values? So maybe Judith, I can ask you to start to give sort of your final remarks and then I'll come to Dr. Peter Kimboa, Peter Varndell, Abdul Mukhtar, and then Elizabeth Jenga. Okay, uh, thank you, Carol. So for the, of course, for the success of PPP, one of the things I think one of the panelists spoke about is trust. Trust is very key because when there's no trust between parties, 
then of course uh, it means along the way uh, the project may stall or or things may not go the way it is anticipated so trust is the key thing even as we start again just outlining what each party is expected to do i think that is also very key what is the responsibility of each party and what and their delivery the delivery timelines upon uh, uh, that program that is also very important uh, because if you just leave it uh, vague then of course everybody will assume that i expected the other party to do it and it, it was not of course myself uh, the third thing is also to appreciate, I think we are uh, also for the public sector is to appreciate that uh, collaboration and uh, partnership is very important. It's not competition, that we are doing this for the sake of society, uh, or we are doing it for the sake of development, or we are doing it for the sake of ensuring that we move forward, or it's part of innovation uh, that will change, you know, a way of doing things, maybe shorten, uh, 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 make things efficient or shorten uh, a time frame or a, a time span of something. So that is also very important. So I think it's, uh, as I'd, uh, just in summary, is uh, trust, just making sure that every partner is aware of what is expected of them and to look at it in terms of long term that it is supporting the society or the community that it is. So just as I conclude, uh, what I would say is that the pandemic has now taken us back to the drawing board to remind us again of the importance of uh, uh, working together and putting our synergies together with our diversity of skills and our expertise and also uh, in terms of uh, what we do in our organizations. Uh, therefore, we must take advantage of it now, uh, given that uh, we are going through this pandemic. We, secondly, we also realize that you cannot do things alone. Uh, one of our, our panelists gave a good example that uh, in Africa, when we cook, we have three stones. So you cannot say that one stone will do it and one stone will be left behind. So we need to work in collaboration so that we can be able also to get out of this pandemic successfully and ensure that also our society uh, also benefits out of it. Thank you. So over to you, Carol. Thank you, Judith. Thank you for that extensive but fairly good summary. I appreciate that. Before I call on PK to give his closing remarks, Dr. Mukta, there's a long, there's a long question that somebody that somebody called Lit, Lit I'm, I please don't want to butcher your name, so please forgive me. Little Hare Sarki is asking. So, Dr. Abdul Mukhtar, if you could get on the chat button and just respond to the question from uh, Sarki as we hear from PK. Dr. Mukta, you're there? Yes, I'm here. Do you want just, me to answer live or do you want me to answer the on the chat box? Just in the interest of time. And just remember okay. to hit um, reply to everyone so that they can see okay. it. Thank you. PK? Thanks very much, Carol. I, I think what we would want to look at, first of all, is the fact that we have uh, right now an obstacle. The obstacle is the way. We have a lot of work to do, but like many of us, we tend to overestimate what we can do. Uh, we tend to overestimate what we can do in two years, and we underestimate what we can do in 10 years. Really, this is a journey, and we have to start on it, but we have to be very deliberate and intentional about it. We have to agree on certain uh, measurement scheme that we are making progress. We are, not, we are not really struggling for perfection. We are just struggling for progress. And we are going to compete for inches, not miles. We are going to move slowly, systematically, and build this conversation while raising the level of aspirations of Africans. We are the ones to master the destiny. We are the ones to control the ideas that will shape this destiny. Thank you very much, Carol. Thanks, BK. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Dr. Mukhtar, thank you so much for your response on the chat. Appreciate it. Your closing remarks. Thank you. Just look, um, uh, you know, I've attended so many workshops on PPPs, and I think that in Africa, we need to move beyond talking about PPPs and actually doing and implementing them. Uh, like I said, you know, all the frameworks that we put in countries, they don't translate into actual PPPs. Um, there are a lot of issues. They are not perfect the way they are structured. We are still learning. In fact, the whole world is learning. If you look at just, just not Africa, you know, uh, globally around the world, PPPs can be difficult. You know, so we are not really, uh, you know, struggling in Africa because, you know, we, uh, we have issues. Uh, yes, we do have issues, but I think that it's a, you know, it's an, everybody's trying to learn still about this new financial model. 
What I have to say is, look at the world changes, and really the, the, the gap in infrastructure financing globally, and in Africa especially, you know, is such that you have to have innovative solutions. So we cannot really run away from PPPs. We just have to make them work. I think that uh, we should um, just walk through, uh, find a few good examples, get the low-hanging fruits, and make them work. There are a few good examples. We should learn from them. We should build on them. My hope is that going forward, you know, every single project, infrastructure project in Africa, you know, before it's even implemented, you know, the first question people ask is, how do we do it by PPP? It is only when you cannot have, uh, it cannot work by PPP, then you even think about public financing of projects. So it should be, my vision for this is that, you know, 10 years from now or even uh, earlier than that, is that PPP should be the default way of financing infrastructure projects in Africa. We can do it, we should do it, we should just get on with it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, I'd like to come to Peter Fandel for your uh, closing remarks. Yeah, I think just from my side, I think uh, don't ever underestimate the willingness of business to contribute and to support the, the execution of, of government programs. I think um, yeah, typically, like Dr. Mukta said, there's been so much talk around PPPs for, for many years now. Um, and typically the, the people that, that from business, the people that government try to collaborate with is more than investors and the, and let's call it the, the construction company suppliers. But you know you need to look a bit broader than that. You ultimately, who are the people who are going to be using the infrastructure? Look, look at a much broader cross section of of, um, of business, and that's where you'll find the people that are really truly looking to support government to to help themselves ultimately. You know, to to manage their own logistics, transport, energy, water risks as they relate to their to various businesses. Um, so you know, just that there is that opportunity. I think um, no, obviously mindful that of trust, which we have discussed earlier. Um, yeah, I think we'd be fools to say that there isn't a trust deficit out there. Um, and, you know, but that shouldn't be the, the stumbling block. I and mean, you need to find ways to, to, to bridge that trust deficit. Um, and, you know, from our experience, the, it's, it's, you have to find a way to neutralize these platforms such that you, you have all stakeholders involved working towards a common, a common vision, but with somebody sitting in the middle potentially to, to facilitate and broker that, 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 that common effort. Um, yeah, so, you know, like I said, there, there's lots of ways of doing it, but it, it's a, it takes commitment from, from both sides. Um, and again, I'm, I'm very talking about the early stages of things. I'm not talking about the long term, you know, which Dr. Mukta gave much more detail on and knows so much more about. Um, yeah, so that, that's our, our plea to, to governments is to just think a little bit more broadly. You know, there's some great examples globally in the UK and Australia about how they've created permanent structures to to help to prioritize infrastructure projects, to, to recognize which are PPPs, there's what, what are not PPPs, and to make it an accountable mechanism where, where everybody's aware of what's going on. So there are lots of good practices out there that we can, that we can replicate. But yeah, we, 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 we love being part of this conversation and, and, and look forward to contributing wherever possible. Thank you, Peter. Uh, finally, Elizabeth Jenga. Thank you. Thank you, Caro. Well, my remarks would be the conversation on the uh, PPP projects, especially as far as it relates to the African continent is ripe. Uh, just looking at, you know, the level of economic growth, we are growing. And at the back of that, the population grew. I mean, the population is also growing. And that is, of course, putting in a lot of pressure on the infrastructure. And the outcome of that is a huge infrastructure deficit and a huge infrastructure financing gap. And that calls for the private sector because all that is happening at the back of a shrinking fiscal space. Governments all over the world have never been able to provide all the services that are required to sustain you know, the, the public sector needs. And that is where the private sector comes in. So ours is just to invite the private sector, both in Kenya and on the African continent to partner with the public sector in providing you know the basic infrastructure that we also need because that is what is going to cost the difference thank you well done. um because i have one minute to just ask dr mukta there's a burning question here that's coming through uh, so i'll just address it to dr mukta and somebody's asking in as much as ppp is a result-oriented approach to governance 
uh, this person who's transmitting from a phone, Techno to be precise, has some fears on the aggressive involvement of the Chinese government in Africa. So how can you re avoid recolonization of Africa through PPPs, especially at the AFDB level where you're, you, know, you really have a line of sight on a lot of what's going on through the continent? Maybe you can address that last question and then I'm going to uh, hand uh, so thank over you. to Edda to bring the session to a close. Okay, thank you, Carol. Look, I don't want to go into uh, uh, politics because that's that's not my job. But uh, from a development perspective, you know, whatever you do, um, as we talked in 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 PPPs, you know, you need partners, you know, and partners everywhere with governments, with a uh, uh, private sector, and so on. Uh, I think that uh, that's part of the thing that we're talking about in really helping governments to build capacity to be able to manage uh, their own side of the of the story. You know, you need. Uh, the, the, one of the key challenges is, of course, the governments, whether it's Chinese or non-Chinese or private sector, you know, they need to have the right tools to be able to negotiate very well, uh, to be able to understand the financing models, to be able to understand the long-term uh, implications. Um, this is not saying there is no capacity in government, but, you know, the traditional way of uh, financing projects through the public sector, and now when you start, I mean, talking about partnerships and um, uh, capacity and so on, you need uh, different type of skill sets. Now in the ADB especially, you know, I, I need to mention this, we have a facility called the uh, ALSF, Africa uh, Legal Support Facility, which is an independent facility that we established in the ADB, it's independent of the bank, uh, with many shareholders in, in that, is housed in the bank. We actually, the role of that ALSF facility is to help countries in negotiations, in looking at contracts, in sign, so we play that role with governments, uh, original member countries that we call them, uh, our shareholders. So it's available, they know it. Uh, anytime they have a big project like this, whether it's a Chinese or a private sector come in and saying, oh, sign this, uh, they come to us and we look at it and we make sure that everything is in line with uh, best practices globally, uh, but more importantly, is in the best interest of the country and the citizens of that country. So countries, uh, they should know that there is help and DFIs can actually help in that, in making sure that they're not taken advantage of by uh, a third party, uh, whatever that third party may be, yeah. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Mukhtar. Um, I would like to thank all my panelists. I'd first like to start with thanking our keynote speaker, Ms. Judith C.D. Odiambo. I'll just ask the panelists to just turn your cameras on so that we can sort of say a, a, an appreciation to you and and the participants can be able to see who you are. So Judy, thank you so much for your insights and uh, especially for stepping in at the last minute. Uh, that was a quick one and we appreciate your insights. I'd like to thank Ms. Tiki Bernard from the Shared Value Institute. She had to leave very suddenly. So Vuyo, we hope you'll take our thanks to her. I'd like to thank uh, Peter Varndell from the CEO of NEPAD. Thank you again very much for your insights, Peter. Uh, Dr. Uh, Abdul Mukhtar from the African Development Bank. It was a pleasure to be here. We know it's early in the morning where you are. So we know you've got a big shot of coffee before you came on to this uh, session. We appreciate your time. Um, I'd like to thank Ms. Elizabeth Jenga from the Acting Business Development Manager at Kenjan and uh, Dr. Peter Kimboa the CEOs, from the CEO Summit Uganda. To all my panelists, Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and for your extremely valuable insights. Without further ado, let me hand over to um, Eda Muni, who is going to bring this session to a close. Eda Muni is the executive director, uh, director, I beg your pardon, of executive education at Strathmore Business School. Thank you, Carol. Um, thank you, panelists, for such an engaging conversation this afternoon. And I think the call to action to us as uh, the private sector, as the public sector, and as the DFIs is can we create the Africa that we want, or as Dr. Chiboa calls it, the Africa as it should be. And I think we have the plan or the strategy of partnering between the private sector, the public sector, and the DFIs. And so I just want to welcome each one of us uh, from the private sector, from the public sector, that lets us join hands and be able to recover the economy that we have lost. I think uh, Dr. Mukta mentioned we have lost about 10 years and that is just as it is. We don't know what is going to happen after this. So let us build, uh, join hands together, build the economy of the African countries and be able even to grow even further beyond this pandemic that we are experiencing. 
So for me is to say thank you so much to the participants. Thank you for your contribution, your participation, your questions. Uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Caro, for uh, moderating this panel. Thank you, the panelists, uh, and Caro has mentioned each one of you. I'd like to thank the teams from SBS and SBI. Uh, that is, we have uh, Caro Munene, who is on, on standby for support. We have Tanya on support there. We have Shadrach Mangangi, who is supporting us as well. We have Wio, who have worked uh, very hard to make this happen. We have Rosemary Olale, and uh, we also have um, Richard Wajohi, and uh, we have David Piror. So thank you so much, team, for ensuring this has happened. I would also want to pass a vote of gratitude to the management uh, committee of Strathmore Business School for supporting us. And uh, on that, I want to give thanks to Dr. Zenga for the support, as much as he's not here and as sticky as well. So with that, I want to say thank you and welcome you to the next CEO dialogue that will be on 19 November. The dates have shifted a bit from the first Thursday of the month to 19th November, same time. 2.30 p.m. East African time. We'll be sharing more details uh, on your emails and we look forward to hosting each one of you. So thank you so much and enjoy your afternoon. Asante.